are now more than 50 days into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And by now you've heard about the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or NATO in the news. And you probably wondered, why is it so hard to add a no-fly zone when President Zelensky asked for one? Or why hasn't NATO stopped the war yet? To explain, we bring in Rachel Rizzo. She's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. Rachel, thank you so much for being here. So almost two months ago, when the world was teetering on the edge of whether or not an invasion would happen, NATO and the U.S. said Russia would face severe consequences. But nothing is stopping Putin from killing innocent people. So what is NATO's actual power and authority then? So I think it's important to denote between the authority of NATO as an alliance and what bilateral countries are doing to aid Ukraine. So NATO as an alliance, obviously, it has 30 members. It's a consensus-based organization. So any decision that NATO makes has to be made by every 30 ally agreeing to something. Now, inadvertent escalation is a huge worry for those 30 allies. And so the alliance is trying to toe a very careful line from offering support for Ukraine and offering Western solidarity and not accidentally doing something that might escalate in a way that brings the entire Western alliance into the war. Now, what we've seen from individual allies, um, we've seen the United States send um, ammunition, rifles, guns. We've seen um, the Slovaks and the S-300 um, surface-to-air missile system. So we're seeing allies offer one-on-one -on -one support, but NATO as an alliance is sort of a different story. So for those who are not familiar, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Now, Putin demanded that the country not be included. So why was this so important for Ukraine to have this membership, but also from Russia's standpoint, keeping Ukraine out? So there are a couple things here. Ukraine is in what Putin would consider his sphere of influence. So he has seen the consistent expansion of NATO especially since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, as a threat to not only his own security, but a threat to what he considers his sphere of influence. Now, one of the most important things that comes along with NATO membership is the Mutual Defense Clause, Article 5 of NATO's founding document, um, the Washington Treaty, which basically says an attack against one is an attack against all. So if Ukraine was a member of NATO and it had come under attack by Russia, it could invoke Article 5 and the rest of the NATO alliance would be obligated by treaty to come to its defense. Obviously, because it's not a member, it doesn't have the um, ability to invoke Article 5. So that's why it's relying on bilateral support rather than um, support from NATO as an alliance. And you know, we're all watching the images or watching this war happen. President Zelensky has been begging for a no-fly zone. So what's holding NATO back, aside from Ukraine not being a member country, but just NATO holding them back from authorizing it? So this was a big conversation over the last couple of months, and, and you're exactly right. Zelensky has been calling for a no-fly zone for weeks now, especially in light of Russia's indiscriminate bombing campaigns against certain Ukrainian cities. The problem is, is, is this question again about inadvertent escalation. Is NATO ready not only to say that a no-fly zone is, exists, but are they ready to enforce it? Saying that there is a no-fly zone over certain parts of Ukraine doesn't make it so. What makes it so is the willingness of Western countries to enforce the no-fly zone, to potentially shoot down Russian planes, to potentially fly into Russian territory um, and destroy missile silos on in Russia. These are not things that NATO as an alliance is willing to do because of the worry of how this might escalate. We've seen Putin use the nuclear saber rattling tool over the last few weeks, and it's not clear whether he means it, but the worry and, and the concern is there. So that's why we've seen NATO as an alliance not say yes to the establishment and enforcement of a no-fly zone. So, Rachel, you said it right there. The next threat now is if Russia deploys chemical or biological weapons in Ukraine. And it, again, it's a scenario that NATO leaders say would have consequences. But what are you finding? Is the West ready to take on Russia if that happens? 
Militarily, I would still say no. And I hate to say it, but I, I do think that what we've seen over the last six or seven weeks is a real unwillingness and um, and uh, not a desire to get involved militarily in a way that might bring NATO countries into the war. You know, from a U.S. standpoint, we just pulled out of Afghanistan. This is a country that is war weary. Um, people don't want to go fight another war. And so the United States is going to do everything it can to avoid that scenario. What I do think will happen, especially if it is found that Russia has used chemical weapons or escalates in another way, Western sanctions will continue to tighten. When you talk to sanctions experts around the United States, they say we're about at a seven or eight out of 10 on the strength scale. So there's always further to go. This means that in addition to sanctioning the Russian central bank, which we've already done, um, to sanctioning certain banks and kicking them out of the international SWIFT, sanction, uh, SWIFT system, we could see the Europeans start to embargo Russian energy, which the continent is heavily reliant on and which it still pays Russia for. Um, so I think the next step here would be potential energy sanctions, which would continue to cripple the Russian economy. But we have to watch pretty closely uh, as to what that might actually look like in reality. Rachel Rizzo from the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us.